There's a lot more to the obesity discussion that I'd love to get into, but that's not what this podcast is about. We will touch on that another day. I am gathering my notes and my thoughts about it because I know a lot of people who've gone down the pathway of obesity. I know several who have come back. It's nuanced and it's not just a character flaw. It's not just because they're lazy. I'm so sick of some of the comments I'm seeing online. It's really grossing me out. I know back in 2020, I was gunning for people to wake up and realize that the state that they were living in, meaning the physical state that they were living in, whether it be an obese body, a metabolically dysfunctional body, that that was going to make them more inclined to bad outcomes and poor outcomes with COVID. And it was really important for me that people understand the nuances of what was going on inside their bodies so that they could make themselves more resilient and so that they could actually have a fighting chance if and when COVID came knocking. And I got so much pushback on that and got called fatophobic and got called all kinds of names that I just think were really misconstrued because at the end of the day, the messaging had nothing to do with how people got into an obese state. I was just simply trying to let people know that the powers that be were not really doing us a lot of favors in that they weren't giving us a lot of information about how we could fortify our bodies. If you embark on an insulin sensitive, metabolically healthy lifestyle now, the changes that happen for you inside your body start very, very quickly. And it takes about 90 days for lab work to show up and show these changes, but the benefits start dramatically within the first week. And so I was simply trying to get folks over the past few years to wake up to the crisis we were in. It has become very unfashionable to talk about this topic. People on both sides get mad at me, whether I'm talking about the implications that come with longstanding obesity, whether I'm talking about type two diabetes, whether I'm talking about Ozempic, people get so mad and so fired up and I get it. It's a very charged subject and people have emotions all over the place about it. All I'm trying to give you guys is the facts and let you know how it all trickles down in your health. The health at every size movement is a hypothesis and it's just not factually true either, but we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic, Wegovy. Actually, everyone's railing on Ozempic, but Ozempic, just FYI, is the diabetes drug. No one seems to have a problem with the use of that. The problem people are having is actually with Wegovy, but they're using the term Ozempic because, just like I am because it gets people's attention. It gets you to read. It gets you to pay attention and listen. And all I'm trying to simply do is let you know that there is a way to do this that's different. That's why I have created my program, Ozempic Done Right. There is a way to do this that allows people to not have any side effects or very minimal side effects. And I'm talking to so many doctors and clinicians that are doing it right and are doing it in a way that is part of a comprehensive treatment plan and is conducive to patient longevity and patient success. And patients aren't walking into these horrific side effects. But since these peptides have been on the market 20 years now, different versions of them, we only just started hearing about the dangers and how deadly it was and all of the terrors of it in the past couple of years when the conversation started veering towards weight loss. And I think that's just gross. So there's a lot more I want to say about this. I'm not trying to defend Ozempic or Wegovy. I am defending this peptide though, because it's a signaling peptide hormone, you guys, just like any hormone. If you were to be put on crazy high doses of testosterone or thyroid or estrogen or anything like that, you'd feel terrible. You wouldn't blame the hormone. You'd blame the doctor who prescribed it. You'd blame the dosing strategy or the pharmaceutical company that suggested the dose be that high. Whenever any patient is having side effects from any drug, we pull them back on the dose. And for some reason, the lunacy of this is just to keep cranking up the dose and people start having terrible side effects, but some people don't. And these are not drugs also. Drugs sit on receptors and do things that change the way that the cell works. So pathways get blocked or pathways get pushed. Peptides are different. 
Peptides are actually just strings of amino acid that are naturally occurring in the body. Semaglutide is actually very closely resembling the natural GLP-1 inside of our bodies, which we cannot all stimulate. There's this misnomer that there's nature's Ozempic and that we can just crank some supplements and herbs and we'll just make all the GLP-1 we need. That is factually incorrect. Sometimes people's L cells are fried out because of longstanding leaky gut or gut issues or gut inflammation or aging or body-wide inflammation. Their L cells are petered out. You cannot stimulate them to go. So some people are actually mechanically GLP-1 deficient. And some people are genetically inclined to GLP-1 deficiencies. And other folks, including those, and we have the data on this, look it up. It's not a hard Google search. Those with fatty liver, obesity, and type 2 diabetes are known to have GLP-1 deficiencies. Is it chicken or egg? We don't know. Genetic mutations are showing up that will make somebody more inclined towards GLP-1 deficiency. So there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm trying to do it over a series of podcasts as best I can, but I'm getting met with so much venom and vitriol, and it's ridiculous. And the people that are coming at me do not have anything but emotions behind them, and they are factually incorrect. 